Well, thank you so much for joining us for our, our new season of Ask Leave Seminars. It's always delightful to have the opportunity to speak to uh, emerging leaders. I call you apprentice leaders, and by the way, I'm an apprentice leader myself, always learning, and that's the neat thing about leadership. No matter where you are in your leadership development, you are still uh, growing, learning, having the opportunity in whatever situation you face to take the best from that improve and get better. So what I like to do in these Ask Leave seminars is go over topics that I think are, are timely, uh, interesting for uh, your generation. And um, today, as you know, I've chosen the topic of happiness. Now let me throw a thought experiment out to you. If you imagine two people, imagine a woman who is walking here, for example, and she discovers she just won the lottery. And she's going to be ecstatic. Now imagine a man who's walking here, and he gets run over by a bus out here. Now project one year in the future. Who do you think is going to be happier? The, the woman who uh, won the lottery, or the man who was hit by the bus and becomes a uh, paraplegic? Who do you think is going to be happier a year from now? Okay, well, let's get a show of hands. Do you think she is going to be happier or less happy than the, the guy who's now a paraplegic? What do you think? The per, who's happier? The, the woman? Hands? The wo okay, four of you say the woman is going to be happier who wins the lottery ticket. So I'm assuming the rest of you have decided, but I want to show of hands. The rest of you are saying that the person who is the paraplegic will be happier. Wow, you are a sophisticated audience. You are a very different audience from what I am used to because 99% of American audiences say that the person who wins the lottery is going to be happier a year from now. And you know what? People who think that are absolutely incorrect because it depends on your baseline of happiness in the first place. And it turns out that the person who wins the lottery, if that person is unhappy going into that crisis in their life. Yes, winning the lottery is a crisis. It, it totally restructures your life, it changes your outlook, and it ruins many people. And it turns out that if, if her baseline of happiness was not very high before she won the lottery, it's not going to be any higher afterwards. Whereas if you have a very chipper person who, yes, has that terribly tragic day of being hit by a bus and discovers that he can no longer use uh, his, his limbs, he actually has a chance of being happier um, than, than the other person with a different baseline. And that's what the research shows, and that's Dan Gilbert's research, and it's, it's uh, something that we ought to keep in mind. This is a mystery, though, to us, and it's something worth unpacking as we uh, think about happiness and leadership. Now, you guys know, as an historian, I like to think about the American presidency, and one of the things that I've been uh, trying to determine is whether leadership and happiness have a relationship. And let me just throw my thesis right out there for you right now. I don't think they have much relationship. I originally thought, like you know, Dan Gilbert's little experiment with the with the the woman who wins the lottery and the guy who's a paraplegic, that there would be you know sort of a natural common sense correlation. But do you know the more I've read about leaders, people like uh, James Stockdale, who was in the Hanoi Alcatraz prison during the Vietnam War for almost eight years. And yet, he was a great leader through that whole grim experience. So even being in a very unhappy circumstance seems not to erode one's leadership ability at all. Leadership skill set seems to be different from whether we have a personal sense of well-being. And we see this again and again when leaders all you have to do is think a little history here. When leaders have been faced with great danger, when they're about to lose their lives, obviously on the well-being scale, they have zero sense of well-being, and yet they can still lead, even if they know they're about to die or fall on a sword. So I think this is fascinating. It's counterintuitive. We have to struggle with that a little bit because we are obsessed with the idea of happiness in this culture of ours. We see it in a Niagara of ways, in shelf after shelf of 
self-help books on how to be happy, generated by our therapeutic culture. We see it in a cottage industry of so-called happiness coaches, happiness experts. We see it in the Gallup organization's world poll. More than a half million people have already been polled about whether you know, they're happy or not, to what degree they have a sense of well-being. We see it in the University of Chicago's general social survey of happiness. And I see heads nodding, familiar with this. It's been coming out since 1972. Uh, there's a world database of happiness out of Rotterdam. And I was surprised when I was doing the research for this talk, I was, re I was surprised to discover the number of TED Talks. You know, uh, Brian and Adam have turned me on to TED Talks. I was surprised to discover the number of TED Talks that really go into whether people feel that sense of flourishing and well-being and peace that we call happiness. So we're all thinking about it. You're thinking about it. I'm thinking of how to be happier. All of them, all those folks out there, they're thinking about it too. We know it is a universal back there. But there is no consensus. You figure, what, yesterday was the day that we celebrated the seven billionth person on Earth? There have been a total of 10 billion people in all of human history on Earth. Well, it's, it's like that old joke about historians. You put 10 historians in the room and ask them for 10 interpretations of an event, you'll get 11 interpretations from the 10 historians. It's sort of like that with, with happiness. We don't know, even though we're all obsessed with it, we don't know how to define it very well. Your definition is different from yours. Social scientists can't come to agreement. Novelists who've dealt with literary characters and struggled with you know, the arc that a literary character takes in a book. There's so many different definitions of happiness. There's no consensus on how to get there. I mean, if, if you don't know the goal, because you can't commonly define it, then there's certainly no roadmap that makes sense to get to such a, an amorphous goal. Philosophers have been talking about it for 3,000 years. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. And there's no consensus. Does this not strike you as strange? We all want it. We all have our common human nature. And yet there is no consensus on what this happiness is. I began a little personal survey just looking at some of my own experience, um, listening to people who claim that they were happy. Let me give you a few examples of what I've heard to thoroughly confuse us all, OK? as a baseline. What I'm trying to do here, obviously, is sort of is shake up our paradigms of what we think will make us happy. So please listen to this with an open mind. Let's start with individuals who practice the dominant religion of our culture, Christianity. It turns out that during the Cold War, back in the 1980s, I had the opportunity to teach in Germany for a year. And I taught at a gymnasium, which is a college prep high school. And what struck me was when spring break came around, I asked the students where they were going, and some of the students looked at me and they said, we're going to go behind the Iron Curtain, and we're going to distribute some literature to people. Uh, we want people to feel connected. We want them to know that we're praying for them and that kind of thing. And I said, that's mighty dangerous, isn't it? I said, yes, uh, we will be put in hard labor camps if we're caught. I said, why are you doing such a thing? I said, because we feel that we owe it to our family members who are stuck on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And then they began to tell me heartbreaking stories about some of the relatives. This one, this one woman who is a, a wonderful violin player, a violinist uh, at the Christmas concerts, very striking in her musical abilities. But she told us about her uncle who had uh, been tortured to death. And the way the Stasi would do it, the secret police behind the Iron Curtain, they knew that one blow where your liver is would leave a very small mark and be fatal. Take you a couple of days to die, it would be fatal. So this is what they would do in interrogation. And yet, she got word and her family got word that this man was happy even in his death that there was something about the experience. He knew he was dying for a principle, and he could hold his head high with his integrity and his principle. That does not, not shake up our 
our little way of looking at happiness, you know, sort of the I, me, mine, you know, we think, you know, if, if I can be in a better car, or if I can have a little more power, or if I have a little more money, I'll be happier. No. Try to get your mind around the idea that torture can be a source of your happiness because you're put in the ultimate test. When I lived in Colorado, I used to visit my sister in a Taoist commune. She was a Taoist, and um, she was a potter. And she was a disciple of a man who's famous at that time named Jafu Fang. You can still see the books that uh, Jafu translated. Um, he had journeyed from China to Big Sur, California, then to Colorado. Um, and he taught about Wu Wei, you know, the Taoist, the, the uh, also Confucian notion that if you follow a harmonious path, you will be a happier individual. And you have to surrender your ego to do that. You have to step back from all of your personal conflicts and desires. Well, try to get your mind around surrendering you know, your ego and your individuality as a way to happiness. That's so strange for us in the West. We don't accept that as a way to happiness. Then I started to talk to my cousin, Christopher Clowry, originally from Toledo, then he went to Berkeley to get his undergraduate degree, and he decided, after he took some Chinese classes, that he wanted to be a Buddhist. So my sister goes off to be a Taoist. My cousin, Christopher, goes off to be a Buddhist. He ends up now, today, he's the director of the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. And Christopher and I, or I should call him Hung Shur, that's his, his name as a Buddhist, I've asked, I said, you know, I kind of know the pop culture meaning of nirvana. Could you tell me a little bit more about it? And he said that it's built from two Sanskrit words, meaning blowing, the concept's blowing out a candle. The, that candle, that flame, that heat of desire, of, of greed, of anger, of ignorance, of pettiness, so as to free one of suffering. And it turns out my sister, after she was a Taoist, uh, followed Christopher into the monastery, and now she's a Buddhist nun. And when I saw Pam in Boulder this summer, and her, her name now is Jen, Jen Hai, when I saw Jen Hai this summer in Boulder, uh, she also explained this concept of nirvana, um, where disciples surrender their, their ego. They, they release themselves from these Vesuvian desires that we have inside us to try to get more and, and more and better and better. Again, try to get your mind around not wanting to be happy in order to be happy. That was the idea. When I was a senior in high school, uh, some people came through and taught a bunch of us transcendental meditation. It's kind of an interesting thing. And Maharish Mahesh Yogi taught back in the 1970s that, that one's happiness was, again, surrendering the ego and thinking of oneself as a raindrop falling into the ocean. A raindrop falling into the ocean. Do you think that would make you happy? To lose your individuality in that sense? But that was the concept in the East of happiness, and particularly in the Vedic tradition, or what we'd call Hinduism. When I was a 16-year-old kid living in Texas, I um, wanted to be an architect. I hitchhiked to Taliesin in Madison, Wisconsin, in Spring Green, Wisconsin, outside of Madison. And I wanted to look at what a life of creativity and hard work could entail. I was working for an architect at that time. And at Taliesin, I heard again and again, the source of our happiness is through good work, labor, hard work. Well, again, a lot of Americans don't quite see it that way. We want retirement. We want vacation. I just read an article, courtesy of Brian Flanagan, that says that your generation looks at work as that unpleasant thing squeezed in between two weekends. <laughs> we don't usually look at hard work as a source of happiness, but that's what Frank Lloyd Wright taught. That's what the fellowship at Taliesin and at Taliesin West when I went there outside of uh, Phoenix. That's what they taught. And as a final example, it's counterintuitive to kind of shake us up here, our normal expectations. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and David Kasseret have done so much on death and dying. And David Kasseret's recent book, Last Acts, looks at so many families who've gone through hospice care. I know my family's been through hospice care. I think anymore a lot of our families, as 
you know, we, we just are so much more sensitive and better about how to treat the subject of death and dying. Story after story after redeeming story of people, no matter what they had done in this life, no matter how many people they might have offended, they're on that deathbed. They want reconciliation. And their families were big enough to give them the reconciliation. And peace was had. And the last moments of that life were filled with happiness. Try to wrap your mind around the concept that your death is linked to your sense of well-being and happiness. All the ways that I've just reviewed with you are counterintuitive and shake up our ordinary expectations and hopefully inspire us to rise above our, our tendency to pursue happiness. Now, appreciate the alliteration here. I came up with a list. We want it in power, profit, pleasure, privilege, performance, prestige, and pride in getting our way. That's the way most of us operate. But the literature, the social scientific literature, the most perceptive people writing say it is not in power, profit, pleasure, prestige, and pride in getting our way, or performance that we get ultimate happiness in this life. I want Olivia to have enough time to uh, give a presentation, so I'm going to skip over a lot of the material I have in this talk. However, I would direct you to uh, the blog site, uh, gleaveswhitney.blogspot.com, for the complete talk. And I just want to go through a few things. Here in Michigan, don't we always get the knock that climate is, gets in the way of happiness? It's not true. That is a myth. People in California are no happier than people in Michigan. There's one qualification to that that I'll mention when I mention Daniel Kahneman's work here in just a minute. Uh, but climate is irrelevant to one's happiness. Uh, age, it's interesting. Some people say, oh, well, you know, you get older and you get bitter and all that kind of stuff. Not necessarily true. As people age, they often become happier, less agitated and disturbed. I think as they're getting closer to death. You know, psychologists tell us, you know, as, as the minutes, we know that we have a finite time on this earth. And so it, it's true. A, an 80-year-old is going to look at time much differently from a 20-year-old. And an 80-year-old will tend to say, you know, I have so little of it left. I mean, I know I have so little of it left. I'm not going to waste my time on pettiness and squabbles you know, I, I, I want to have quality time at the end of my life. Um, so they tend to be happier. Baby boomers, however, tend to be the least happy generation right now, which is kind of interesting. But as they're getting older, they're learning to be more content. African Americans are less happy than whites. Men are less happy than women. And uh, we know from uh, the University of Chicago survey that the happiness of a whole people, a whole community, actually ebbs and flows through time. Some great books out there about this. Um, it turns out that having good DNA, your genetic makeup, is essential to your happiness. Your genetics account for 50 to 80 percent of your happiness. And before that makes you despair, think of it. You have 20 to 50 percent of an opportunity to shape your life by the choices you make in your beliefs, your values, your behavior, your lifestyle. So exercise that for greater happiness. And practicing a religion turns out to be important if, if it's a religion you really believe in. 30 to 40 percent of your proclivity to worship turns out to be genetic. So maybe you're not the most religious person in the world, but use the 50 or 70 percent, you know, to guide your worship in a meaningful way choosing a church whose doctrines you believe in and that provide a rich, regenerating experience so that you can relate to others more meaningfully. Having good friends and meaningful relationships is important to enjoying the good life. Having pathways of opportunity to fulfill our potential is important to flourishing. Having the feeling of earned success turns out to be important. Trust babies are not as happy as people who 
work hard and save and have that sense of accomplishment. People who inherit money tend to be less happy. And this is the darker side of the happiness studies. This is the one that always puts a smile on my face. And it's so true of us. We are animals, after all, in so many ways. It turns out that perceiving that we are relatively better off than our neighbors makes us happier. If we have a slightly better car, slightly better job title, if a slightly nicer yard or garden, or we perceive that our spouse is better looking or smarter or whatever, the dark side is we're envious creatures who like to incite envy and misery in others. It's just one of our darker sides. And uh, it makes us happy to do that. <laughs> Did you notice, though, that winning the lottery never made the list? Winning the lottery has nothing to do with happiness and, in fact, may decrease it. I told you I'd mentioned Daniel Kahneman. He, he's just a fascinating guy. He's a, an Israeli-American psychologist and a Nobel laureate. Brian turned me on to, to his work. Uh, he has a great talk on TED.com, and he says, why is it that people can go through an experience and think they're happy while they're going through the experience, but then remember it as an unhappy experience? And conversely, why can people go through an experience, think they're unhappy at the time, but in retrospect, looking back, think they're happy? It's because we have two memory functions in our brain, and one of them is processing what memory will be, and the other is actually the narrative we construct of our life. So you can go through all kinds of grief, but if the narrative about the experience has a happy ending or is positive, then you have a better outlook on life. Other people who have everything good seem to happen to them. But if, if the narrative they're constructing in retrospect is not a happy one, they will be unhappy people. So Kahneman does a brilliant job showing this almost Freudian split inside our brain about how we divvy up our experiences. And the implications are fascinating because you know what? When you're choosing between two or three alternatives, say taking a trip. Oh, you go to Chicago for the weekend or go to fly to Las Vegas or to Florida for the beaches. One of the decisions you're making is what kind of memory, how it'll fit in the narrative of your life when you come back. Do you have better stories to tell? Does it create a little bit of envy in others? That kind of thing. That's part of the human condition. Kahneman does a brilliant job of showing how we are consumers of anticipated memories. That's what you're doing right now when you're making your plans. You're a consumer of your anticipated memory. You're constantly negotiating between your two selves. What's all this add up to? When I was doing my research, and poor Brian and Adam and, and Kathy heard this again and again. This was before Liza came. She, she was spared these conversations this summer. This last spring and summer, I was asked to teach a course on the founders, the founding generation. They're a remarkable group of human beings. And I you know, was discussing with staff the ways these founders were grappling with the concept of happiness. It seems to me the founders had a way of looking at happiness which was really critical, important. If you read the founders, if you read what they said in the Constitutional Convention, you see that they talk about public happiness. Public happiness. I thought, I've never been exposed to such a thing before. Why are they worried about public happiness? I thought happiness was this, do I wake up in the morning with this sense of well-being? If I go buy that lottery ticket, am I going to feel great? The founders said, no, public happiness is essential. And what the founders did, their achievement was to integrate two ways of looking at happiness. This is what they did. They said, okay, 3,000 years of writing, we know people are concerned about private happiness. Thomas Jefferson enshrines the phrase, you have an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And as Jacob Needleman and David McCullough and others have said, this phrase has done more to shape modern sensibilities than perhaps any other phrase uttered in the last 230 years. The right to the pursuit 
of happiness. So the founders said, yes, there is a private element to happiness which is key. What is the private happiness made up of? It's real basic. You cannot have a bad conscience. If you know you've done wrong and you don't make it up to the people you've injured, you have a bad conscience and you will not be happy. A second category that they understood in terms of private happiness is if you are a slave to your passions, if you have addictions, if you cannot control your emotions, you're a slave to those passions, you are not going to be happy. The founders understood that the source of private happiness is very elusive, but that's the baseline. A good conscience and mastery over your passions. But public happiness, huh? What, what's public happiness? How would you measure such a thing? How do you even aspire to such a thing? This is where the founders hit on something that I think is ingenious. They said that the public source of happiness comes from balancing two traditions in our culture that go all the way back thousands of years. One of those tra traditions is called, it's kind of a highfalutin term, don't be intimidated by it, it's called the civic republican tradition that looks at our duties to the community. The other tradition comes back to the Middle Ages and it is the natural rights tradition. It looks at our rights as individuals. And here's the thing. If you have a regime that is just obsessed and focused on duty, you have a totalitarian state, an authoritarian state at the very least. Winston Smith in 1984. If you have a regime that is focused on rights, you know, my right to this and that and the other from you, what I demand of you, you de devolve, as the founders wrote, into, they didn't use the term narcissism because that was not a psychological term yet, but a selfishness, a self-obsession, a narcissism, licentiousness, thinking, well, if I have a right to do it, I'm going to go ahead and do it. So you break moral norms and, and social customs and anarchy politically. The founders understood that you have to merge those two traditions, the civic republican tradition that emphasizes your duties and the natural rights tradition which emphasizes your rights to have an integrated personality. So you see the different levels here, private and public happiness, and then within the public, rights and duties, and you integrate them into your personality. If you're firing on all cylinders with all those elements, then you're probably integrated enough where you're a reasonably happy individual and you're not thinking about it so much. You're not worried about winning the lottery. You're worried about doing the right thing. You're worried about making a difference in this world, about how the community is doing, as opposed to just how I, me, mine are doing, which we get enough of today in our therapeutic culture. So I think the founders hit on something that they can teach us today. Yet again, this great assembly of geniuses can teach us about our basic drive to be happier people. And I have been happy to share it with you today. So thank you very much. You've been a great audience.